out there in Houday Nation. Welcome to Men in Stripes, brought to you by StripeHype.com, a fan-sided network, as we are one day away from training camp starting tomorrow, where the Bengals have other rookies signed and are genuinely, for the most part, healthy uh, going into camp. Holy moly, how many times have we been able to say those two sentences uh, the day before camp? I don't know. But Tim Daniel here, excited to be back after a week hiatus where I was Enjoying the sounds of my teenage days at the Vans Warp Tour. Uh, but it's so excited to be back here with none other than the co-host of Men in Stripes and the co-host of StripePipe.com, none other than Matthew Wilson. How are you, Tim? I am I am good, man. I am uh, I am on vacation this week. I am heading to Chicago tomorrow to see Team USA play basketball against Venezuela. So uh, I'm doing all right, man. And to think you could have been in Columbus watching uh, international soccer. That would have been cool, actually. I would have totally loved to it, but um, same week, so I just had to pick one or the other. All right. I'll give you a pass. <laughs> so, <laughs> with that being said, uh, we understand we're getting a little too close to the season, so we're going to start quickly going through these opponent previews, doing two a week. Uh, so this week we're going to touch on the New England Patriots and the Cleveland Browns. Which is basically like saying we're going to break down Citizens Kane and then we're going to break down McGruber if we're talking movies, right? Uh, um, I, I, I was thinking like going from, uh, you know, uh, what, what is it, uh, uh, Sherlock Holmes, because he cheats everything, mm-hmm. to uh, Robin Hood Men in Tights. But. Or, you know what? We'll, 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 we'll go there. It's like going to Monty Python and the Holy Grail. <laughs> There's some great punchlines, but at the end of the day, it still somewhat seems like a joke, and yet it's a good movie. So there is that. <laughs> um, believe it or not, folks, here at Ben and Strips, we have a guest this week. Uh, this morning, I touched about, had a quick interview with uh, Mo Egger of ESPN's 1530, uh, one of the voices of the city since then. We talk about his thoughts going into the season. Um, so that was one of the cool things there. So let's get into some football news to start off the bat. Uh, we've been talking about this for a few weeks in regards to the Bengals' week one opponents. And I told you that I felt that in come week one, Ryan Fitzpatrick would be on this team uh, playing for the Jets. And sure enough, uh, he signs a one-year $12 million deal yesterday, which first off, props to him for getting his money, for holding on to the Jets and just having that battle with him until he wins. Kudos, man. Way to fight the machine, Fitzy. That Harvard education in full effect there. Um, second, you know, I don't think minicamps and OTAs are going to be too big of a worry like some people are trying to say like they will. Um, but I don't think he's going to have another year like he had last year by any stretch of the matter. Um, but still, as far as week one goes, very big news, you know, especially being a Bengal opponent. Um, still am putting the check mark next to a W for the Bengals for that game. But I think it's a little closer than we said at first. Yeah, I'll give you that one. I, I, you know, I still think there's a little bit of a distraction there because obviously it's a one-year deal, and you know what's going to happen going forward. And so I think there's still, I think there's still some uh, some battle there. Not to mention he wasn't at OTAs, he wasn't at mini camp. I mean, I, I still think there's a little bit of an uphill battle for him. Would you been in the league as long as he is? Though? Do OTAs and minicamps really matter? To get things down with your receivers and your running backs and even some of your new linemen? Yes. Absolutely. I, I, I don't know, man. Especially, like, it, the system didn't change. Um, they don't have a whole lot of new weapons besides, like, Forte. Um, you know, they still have Marshall and Decker. They're pretty easy guys to throw to. Uh, I don't think it's too... I, I mean, it's, it's a big deal, sure. But I don't think it's going to be anything where he's going to completely go out there and not know what he's doing. I'm not saying that, but, you know, timing with linemen, uh, especially younger ones, uh, you know, timing with, with, you know, just everybody in general. You know, that that can break down a little bit. And as I said, when, especially when you get some of the, the younger guys who, uh, you know, who, who come in. If, who, who do they take with their first-round draft pick again? Darren Lee. Okay, so his defender. I, I was trying to think of who that, where they took, because they took an offensive lineman, didn't they? 
Somewhere, yeah. Um, but I don't think they took him as a starter because I think they're still going with uh, the Mangold, the Brickishaw group there that they've had for a few years. Okay, yeah. For some odd reason, I'm thinking... Um, yeah, it wasn't until fifth round. It was Brandon Shell out of South Carolina. Not to say he couldn't end up starting. Just saying that we're... Uh, that, Still that, a little that's bit probably away. not the game plan, yeah. Yeah, and, and I was thinking... I, I know what I was thinking. I saw I saw the OL, and I forgot the B on Jordan Jenkins. Ah, uh, okay. So that's where I was th I was thinking it was a third rounder. Fair enough. So, so yeah, there's that there. So, but... Uh, no, and, and, and some some interesting news out of, out of camp is the uh, non-football injury list. You got Burfecht uh, all of a sudden showing up on it, and uh, uh, Malaluga showing up on it, which we knew about Malaluga, but uh, Burfecht showing up on it was kind of a little bit of a, I don't want to say a surprise, but it was a little bit of a, a take back. Yeah. So, I mean, that that's one thing. It's kind of like, okay, what is he fighting? What is he dealing with? Strategic move. <laughs> I mean, do, do we even know what happened there? Because I still haven't seen why he was placed on the um, the, the non-football non, -injury, or non injury list. I haven't either because Marvin basically just said he was going to quote-unquote play it safe by not playing him in preseason games. But that was the last I heard anything in regards to him. Yeah, I haven't seen anything on him, and that that's... I, I probably shouldn't be surprised, because I follow the Penguins, and that's, like, the biggest thing that they do is not release anything. Yeah. Uh, upper, upper body with, uh, injury. <laughs> that's about it. That, like, was the Patriots with Tom Brady is always listed as questionable every week. Well, except for the first four weeks this year. Oh, yeah. Well, and, and he he's always he always shows up to something in a walking boot, right? So. Or Uggs. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we do have to touch on this. I did realize we haven't been on air since this happened. Um, Le'Veon Bell, yeah, another one. Um, Le'Veon Bell is an idiot. Fair. Uh, Le'Veon Bell is basically arrogant, Fair. and uh, Le'Veon Bell is going to learn what idiot and arrogance together actually equals. Also fair. So, uh, th 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 that may sum it up there. <laughs> At least I hope. Um, I did see he's going to file an appeal, and he's guaranteeing he's not going to miss any time. Um, what was it? But, like... The reports are just unbelievable. Like, he's missed, like, he's skipped, like, three or four tests. Yep. Um, his random drug test on April 20th, when he said, you're not going to like that sample. Um, yeah, he's a, he's, um, we always joke that, like, you know, he's never going to play a full season, whether it be injury or suspension. And it looks like that, once again, is going to be the case this year. Well, and don't forget, by the way, According to him, and, and this kind of came out today, um, Benefit of Living, actually, in Pittsburgh. Uh, supposedly, he received the suspension notice in March. Supposedly. Supposedly, uh, it's because he changed his phone number, which, of course, uh, as an adult, aren't you supposed to let your employer know when you change their phone number? And uh, also, don't forget that, of course, on top of everything else, he was already suspended for two games, which, by the way, is the first penalty under the NFL rules uh, for uh, essentially driving under the influence of marijuana. Yep. So he had nowhere really to go. And so I hate to break it to him, but marijuana is still against the rules. Marijuana is still illegal. By the way, eat recreationally, and in Pennsylvania, actually, until I think it is in August, maybe maybe first of September, it's still illegal in any form. It won't be legal as a medicinal drug for at least another month or so. So, 
any which way you look at it, if you're smoking marijuana, you're a moron. And you're putting your team and you're putting yourself in a position that's uncomfortable and a distraction. Yeah, I mean, he's, um, he's definitely getting to the point of his talents outweigh the drama and that's why he's around kind of thing. Um, but he's certainly a dra- I mean, he's certainly got a little drama to him, obviously. Did, did he claim yet that he was doing it to rec- uh, for, for his pain? Has that, has that happened yet? No. Okay, so I'm looking forward to that being the next step we take here. Um, man, so could you imagine if they go into the season, they have, they're already out with Mark Davis Bryant for a year, and then they're out <laughs> a Le'Veon Bell for four games? It's, I mean, okay, fine. You have Antonio Brown. Okay, fine, you have D'Angelo Williams. But no offense, D'Angelo Williams at some point isn't going to be as effective. Teams are finally going to figure out how to defend against him. It was a little bit different because, you know, we really haven't seen D'Angelo Williams. Um, and we haven't especially seen him behind the Steelers line. So right. there's adjustments that are being made even as we speak to D'Angelo Williams being in there week two. He can't continuously be the back and be successful behind this line when teams adjust to him. It's 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 the rookie face. I mean, when you see somebody for the first time, you don't know what he's, what he's going to do. Even when you see him for the second time, he can make adjustments. That, but, you know, three or four times, you're going to start making adjustments because you've seen all the tricks. Yeah, uh, that, you know... The age of running back will surely be catching up to him, yep. as it does everyone else. I think he's he's gonna be what thirty one this year. Is he thirty? Is this the thirty years? Is thirty one? I want to say it's. Um, I, I want to say it is uh, the thirty one year, but yeah, not no. every running back. Oh no, no 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 no! We're both wrong. Is he thirty three. He, he's thirty three. Man. So he's really gonna be catching up. Yeah. I mean, Man. I hate to break it to I, re, I hate to break it to Bengals fans, but Adam Jones' age is going to be catching up to him by the end of his contract. Oh yeah, it is. So I mean, he's just outstanding. Like, did you see today? He ran like a four three at camp today. <laughs> Jesus Christ! <laughs> no, at what six percent body fat? No, four percent body. fat. Four percent body fat. I'm sorry. Yeah, like that's crazy. Like that guy will never stop being an athlete. I'm pretty sure. No. And you got to think, too, with Adam Jones, like, um, one of the benefits, you know, I guess this isn't really a benefit career-wise, but I guess in a way it is. Um, there's, what, the year and a half he missed from suspension, um, or when he was in Tennessee. So that's, like, some extra time he has on his body. Um, when he hurt his neck, he was out for a while, if you remember, his first year here. So, like, the dude's probably still got another, I, I agree with you. The end of the contract is probably when you'll see him kind of dip. Uh, but you probably got to think of me the next two years. He's probably still going to be a top, uh, probably the top corner on this team. Yeah. Crazy. But, um, by the way, did you see, uh, kind of going into, obviously, in the, the spirit of training camp, did you see who's going to be uh, joining the Bengals at training camp this year? Jimmy Wilson, man. Jimmy Wilson. As Another in, guy who has some extra time on his body from not being in the game for a little while. Which also, uh, there, there's another one too. They've signed someone other than Jimmy Wilson. Well, no, I meant, did you like actually gonna be there for uh, giving giving people advice? Kind of. Oh a, yeah, as a, Willie's. Yeah, Willie Wh- Anderson. Willie Anderson, which we had to talk about him versus. Uh, Andrew Whitworth. Yeah, we did. I remember this now. I'm looking forward to that because, and, and granted, I mean, we'll see most of the stuff on TV and we'll hear it, everything like that. But you know, Willie Anderson and Andrew Whitworth are probably two of the uh, best offensive tackles. I would say two and three in franchise history behind Munoz. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, and so. Putting both those guys in the room, of course, you have the two young guys with Cedric Ogbui and Jake Fisher. 
who could learn a whole lot from the both of them together. No kidding, man. And uh, so, and, and then you got some of the interior linemen who who could definitely learn from him. Uh, and so, it, it's it's going to be. Um, I'm looking for I'm looking forward to seeing what uh, what he he says at camp. Yeah, man, me too. I think that's a really cool thing. Uh, so I, I'll always enjoy seeing Willie get his chance to uh, be back in the or around the organization. Um, so that that's for sure there. So um, while we're going ahead and move forward here, guys, we do have, like I said, for the first time in Men and Stripes in these six months we've been doing this, we finally have our first guest. We got it is a uh, it's Mo Egger from ESPN fifteen thirty. Mo so happens to be a uh, guy who's been really helpful in me trying to get into the broadcasting business as far as um, he's let me sit on his show. He's been on my previous shows. Um, he's you know If I bump into him at a Reds game, he'll talk to me for about 10, 15 minutes. He's always been very good to me. Um, so I just felt like it made a lot of sense for him to be our first guest, especially talk Bengals training camp preview. So without further ado, here it is. Here's our talk with Mo Egger of ESPN 1530, getting you ready for training camp tomorrow. All right, ladies and gentlemen, after months and months of working on the Men and Stripes podcast, we are finally able to get our first guest to join us, one of the voices of the city of Cincinnati. You can check him out on ESPN 1530 every day from 3 to 6 o'clock. None other than Mr. Mo Egger. Mo, how are we doing this morning? I am, I am great. I'm your first guest? Yeah. Ever? Yeah. yeah. Oh, my. Yeah, not bad, huh? I'm honored. <laughs> so... Uh, jump right into it. This is a Bengals preview, obviously. Training camp starts tomorrow. We know you'll be busy for quite a few months now. Um, how nice is it to hear that football is coming back tomorrow after, you know, we go back to the playoff loss, obviously, uh, how you see and Xavier get bumped from the tournament, and then the rebuilding Reds baseball season. How nice is it to know we have Bengals football back again tomorrow? Well, it's, it's great uh, because from a football standpoint, you know, maybe we can stop talking about last year's playoff game and – from just an overall standpoint, yeah, the, the red season has been miserable. The college basketball season did not end the way we thought it was. It's going to end at least here locally. So uh, to be able to turn the page uh, starting this weekend is, is quite refreshing, quite nice. Yeah, I certainly agree there. Um, you know, obviously a lot of talks coming through, OTAs and mini camps wrapping up uh, in the past couple weeks. Um, you've had a chance to talk about Bill Nish, quite a bit on your show with Paul Harrier, Coley Harvey, Jim, and Um, What are the things you're hearing from this team, from these OTAs and mini camps? You know, obviously we keep reading about Jake Kumaro being the being the camp stars, but uh, any other names are really mentioned that really jump out to you? Well, I mean, I, I think what's going to be interesting is, is the wide receiver spot because there's a lot of names of, of guys who were, you know, with the team during camp last year. You mentioned Jake Kumaro. Uh, James Wright, Mario Alford, those are players who were a part of the team last year during training camp and then for obvious reasons didn't do anything during the regular season. And so, you know, I think it's going to be interesting to see if, if that group of guys, if, if one or two of those can emerge and make the 53 and then ultimately make the, the game day 46-man roster. And I think that the pivot point to that is, is Brandon Tate, you know, a guy who's not very popular with most fans because, you know, he's lower on the depth chart at wide receiver and he's not Adam Jones returning punts, but a guy who brings something to the table that the Bengals themselves value, and that's reliability. He's a reliable punt returner. He does not fumble. Uh, typically, when teams punt away to the Bengals, at the very worst, the Bengals offense charges out onto the field immediately after the punt. So, um, I think they value that. It's, it's going to be up to a guy like Mario Offer to unseat him or somebody else to unseat him. I think that's the big domino that, that has to fall. And the other guy that I'm really looking forward to watching is Andrew Billings, a guy they drafted in the fourth round at defensive tackle from Baylor, who everybody seemed to think was a huge steal for the Bengals in the draft. He's going to be lining up next to a star. Uh, so whoever is lining up next to Geno Atkins is going to be given a chance to make plays. Um, can Andrew Billings do more than Doma Topeko has done? Can he stand out amongst a group of guys that, you know, frankly don't don't really incite that uh, ignite that much excitement? You know, I, I think that's going to be really, really interesting to watch. And then I think if you're looking for a position battle, they lose Reggie Nelson this offseason. They elevate Sean Williams to a starting safety. There's a whole bunch of guys behind him and George Iloka that really haven't done all that much in the NFL. And we saw last year how much Sean Williams had to play. That, to me, is obviously going to be worth following just because 
there's a lot of unproven guys that are going to be competing for backup jobs at safety. Yeah, I certainly agree with you there. I just refresh you real quick. This is Mo Egger from ESPN 1530. If you're not following me on Twitter already, check him out, Mo Egger 1530. A really good everyday blog he has on the Cincinnati Sports World. Uh, so speaking on that Cincinnati Sports World and blogs and articles and analysts, um, I don't think I've ever seen the Bengals going to a season where expectations from professional analysts have been such a wide array. Um, I wrote an article last <coughs> yesterday on the article on Stripe Pipe about how David Carr calls him pretenders and has – very lazy uh, analysis and his reasonings why. Um, Adam Rank from NFL.com has gotten far saying he believes they're a 4-12 and team. But you look at guys like Pro Football Focus who say they're a 10-11 win team. Some people call them one of the top three teams in the AFC. Um, what are your thoughts, you know, what side of the pinnacle they really lean on in that circumstance? Well, I, I kind of take the middle ground. I, I think it's fair to expect them to take a little bit of a step back just because winning 12 games is hard. Um, and that's what this team did a year ago. And uh, I think it's easy to look at them when you go, God, you know, they won 11 games in 2013. They won 10 and tied one in 2014. They won 12 last year, and they've lost players from those teams. Can you really keep that up in a league that's designed for you to not sustain excellence? I think those are very, very fair questions. I think the other thing we don't really – factor in is is how up until the point where Andy Dalton got hurt, this was the healthiest team in the NFL. I mean, there were there were weeks in the middle of the season last year where there was like nobody on the injury report. Uh, that's hard to maintain. That's that's luck. That's it, it's hard to get that lucky uh, in back to back season. So, you know, I think it's fair to expect them to take a little bit of a step back, but this is a good roster. And let's face it, in the AFC I think you're talking about New England, Pittsburgh. I think you can make a case, a case for the Colts now that Andrew Luck is back, even though they have some deficiencies. Um, and then who else is there? Can you really expect the Kansas City Chiefs to repeat what they did a season ago? That's uh, iffy proposition. Uh, are the Houston Texans going to be that much better with Brock Osweiler? I guess so. But are they really going to, I don't know, make that leap, if you will? I'm not sure. Um, this still looks to me like they have, they have a, a chance to win double-digit games. They have a chance to win the division again. They have a quarterback coming off his best season. They have one of the best wide receivers in the game. When he's healthy, Tyler Eifert is as good a red zone threat as you'll find. They have a star defensive tackle. They have a star when he's on the field and not doing dumb things at linebacker. Uh, they have a, an all-pro uh, corner and Adam Jones, they have a new offensive coordinator, but he's working with parts that I think any first-time offensive coordinator would envy. Um, they've got to rebuild the running game a little bit this year. I think they have the makings of, of a good team that has a chance to get back to the postseason now. If you don't trust them to win a playoff game, that's fair because they haven't earned that trust. And if you want to say the Steelers are better equipped to win the division, I think it's kind of a coin flip. You can convince me of that. But the idea that this team is is uh, you know fall back to the middle of the pack and and be a, a six seven eight win team, uh, I don't see that happening. Barring you know significant injury, um, I, I think these guys have a chance to, to to have another good regular season. And I've gone as far as saying in our in our show that I really feel like Giovanni Bernard could really be the X factor for this team. Um, there is a comfort of the long term contract. There is when the game was on the line last year, he was getting the snaps over Hill. Um, could you see him maybe taking that next step for this for this team? Well, I don't know that next step is is really the right verbiage. I mean, you know, people forget he caught more balls last season than Mohamed Sanu. Yeah, um, he was second on the team in yards from scrimmage. I think if 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 Giovanni Bernard's production in 2016 is a carbon copy of what it was last year, I think this offense will be okay. I mean, this is a guy who carried it just under ten times a game last season and was 10th in the NFL in yards per carry. He was a threat catching balls out of the backfield. Um, I think the idea is for his role to stay the same, but for them to just get more production from Jeremy Hill. I think if they if they end up using Geo more in the run game, it tells you that Jeremy Hill hasn't recaptured the magic of, of 2014. I think if they're throwing the ball to Giovanni Bernard more, it might tell you about what they're not getting from players like, like Tyler Boyd. I think they would like for Geo's production to basically be what it was last year. And singularly, you'll take that. I think he was, 
a bigger factor than people thought he was going to be. I mean, a year ago at this time, there were people wondering, okay, what's his role? Because Jeremy Hill was so good in 2014, and they had all these other weapons. Well, you look back to last year's offense, imagine it without Giovanni Bernard. So, yeah, I, look, it could could he catch more passes? Could he, could he take more handoffs? Those things could happen. But I think if you were to press Tim Van Peek and Marvin Lewis, they would just like Giovanni Bernard to have the kind of year he did last year. And if that happens, then you look elsewhere and go, okay, where are they better? Where are they not as good? Yeah, I, I think that's definitely a fair point there. Uh, so, Mel, you know, thanks again. Always appreciate it. Get you on one last thing here. Um, you had a really, really cool article you wrote on your blog the other day about Mike Brown and uh, his appreciation, you know, as far as turning the franchise around. Um, you and Paul Dannard have been doing the, the podcast where you guys discussed uh, the Bengals Ring of Honor. So um, kind of talk about the background and what made you kind of want to go that route doing that piece. Well, you know, it's, I think the older I've gotten, the more I, I try to look at these guys as, as people and, and human beings. And, and look, I'm, I'm a lifelong Bengals fan. I go back to, you know, the mid eighties being a, a little kid watching them with my dad. And so, you know, I suffered through the nineties and I suffered, I suffered through these 25 and a half years without a playoff victory. And uh, during that time, you know, I said privately a lot of really mean things about Mike Brown. And I said publicly a lot of really mean things about Mike Brown and, they were deserved, but I think you start with, with the way the Bengals are run right now. I mean, this is, in many respects, a model NFL franchise. Uh, they assemble good rosters every year. They draft well. They make strong financial decisions. They don't blow up their salary cap. They do a really good job of, of keeping their best players here. Um, they're really, really consistent and really well run. And I think there's a lot of teams that would, would really uh, be well served by following you know, kind of with the, the Bengals' blueprint. Um, off the field, you know, they've gotten better. Uh, you know, I used to write about the, the Bengals' stadium experience. I think that's been improved. Uh, they've they've kept some of the more affordable or, or at least le- less expensive uh, ticket prices in the NFL, which I think is in part a credit to, to ownership. Just this franchise five years ago, ESPN ranked them as the worst in all the sports. Worse than all the sports. And five years later, we're calling them one of the model franchises in the NFL. Uh, how much of that is on Mike Brown? I don't know. But I do know that every shortcoming and deficiency over the last 25 years, whether it's, whether it can be pinned on him or not, people have gone out of their way to pin them on him. I remember when they lost to the Chargers in the playoffs uh, a couple of years ago doing the postgame show. And my first five calls were all blaming Mike Brown. Mike Brown didn't fumble. Mike Brown didn't play poorly. It wasn't Mike Brown's fault that Andy Dalton played bad or that Giovanni Bernard fumbled or that they gave up, you know, more than 200 yards on the ground. So people point to him for their deficiencies. I think then you have to be fair and the things they do well at least throw some love toward the owner. And then I just, you know, I, I listened to him and I, I read some of the quotes from uh, Tuesday, which is, he talked to the media once a year and, you know, he talked about how much uh, after, you know, decades in pro football, how much he still loves coming to training camp practice. And I, I love people who love what they do. And then he talked about uh, how he doesn't take himself all that seriously. And I love people who don't take themselves all that seriously. And uh, I listened to him talk about how he really doesn't care what people say about him. And I really like people who operate without concern for, for what outsiders are going to say. I've always been told that, man, if you knew Mike Brown, you'd love him. you love him as a guy. And I don't know. The, the more I pay attention to him, the more I think that's probably accurate. It does not erase, uh, you know, all the, the things that frustrated us as Bengals fans for, for many years. It doesn't undo the 90s. It doesn't undo his track record. But, you know, by and large, I, I think you I think you have to have uh, respect for the guy for, for what's happened with his team. And I think you have to, on a human level, he just seems to me to be a guy that you have to like. Yeah, I'm with you on that point for sure. But hey, Mo, thank you so much for taking me a couple of minutes this morning. I appreciate your time. Hopefully we can do this again come January. All right, that'd be great. I'd love that. Awesome. Well, thank you again, sir. All right, man. Thanks. No problem. Awesome. Once again, thanks to Mo for doing that with us. Certainly appreciate it. I uh, really touched on a lot of nice things there, so... I'm glad we can finally get a guest out of the world. Absolutely no. Thanks, thanks a lot to uh, to Mo to, to coming on and uh, and joining joining us here. And uh, 
we look forward to uh, having more guests as we go. Matthew, I think it's rant time. It is rant time. It has to be rant time, right? Well, we just got we just got done with a, a great guest, so it really is rant time. Yeah. All right. So, and I touched on this a little bit with Mo in the interview, as you hear. So, we have seen a lot of predictions for the Bengals this year, uh, as far as. Uh, the transition, the losses there on the offensive side, guys like Jones and Sandu leaving, Hugh Jackson going to Cleveland, Vance Joseph taking a job somewhere else, blah, 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 blah. I guess, you know, some people, like Pro Football Focus, they've got it going on. They know that the Bengals are one of the best teams in the AFC, and they're a team that's going to go out there and compete. Awesome. Uh, there are some people that are, you know, thinks that they're going to be a middle-of-the-pack team in that 8-8 eight and eight frame. Don't necessarily agree with that. I uh, wouldn't go that far. Uh, I'm not saying it's not possible, but I wouldn't say that's going to happen at all. And then there is these goons at NFL.com, like Adam Rank, who said the Bengals will be 4-12. and 12. He's a fantasy football writer. What does he know? And let's see, did you guys get that joke? Because I did the fantasy football previews on Stripe Pipe. That was the joke. Oh, yeah. And then there's David Carr. And I'm going to go ahead and say that, one, I respect what David Carr has done, that as far as being the number one pick, being a guy that everyone thought was going to be trusted to get the Houston franchise up and going and being the face of it. He earned that in college, and, you know, he deserves that for sure, even though it didn't pan out, obviously. Here's what's annoys me about David Carr and his, anal- his analysis. If you look at what we the article I posted yesterday, um, he has, there's two quotes in there from uh, stuff he's done at NFL.com. First one, he says he calls Andy Dalton the most overrated quarterback in the NFL, which I guess Joe Flacco retired and didn't tell anybody. Um, <laughs> so, and he, you know, he goes on to say that um, you lose this player, you lose that player. Hugh Jackson's not running it anymore. He's concerned about you. This is paraphrasing, of course. Okay. You know, yeah, they're losing two guys under the system. Yeah, that, that that's hard. Um, yeah, you're losing the guy that started the system. Okay, I get it. You know, that that's tough. Sure. That's fine. Um, it's the, it's the next con that, like, really annoys me and bothers me off this whole damn thing. It's pure, lazy analysis. It's... You didn't do research. You saw two guys sign free agent deals, and you saw a guy took a head coaching job. So you automatically assume that this team is done, that their window is closed, and that is sh- bullcrap. I almost said it. I stopped myself. Um, and this is this is what I'm, and this is my point there. So he makes this point to say that um, they do the contenders or pretenders, and he calls the Bengals pretenders because Marvin Jones, Muhammad Sanu took jobs. The guys who had a combined six total touchdowns and only four of them were receiving last year left. Oh, no, the sky is falling. Oh, wait, we have two guys in our team that double-digit receiving touchdowns last year. We must have forgotten about that. Oh, but, you know, um, losing Mohamed Sanu is so huge, except for the fact our second-string running back had more receiving yards and catches than him last year. Oh, and also had a 100-yard game. How many does Mohamed Sanu have? Oh, wait. Oh, man, but, you know, they got to be done, right? They have to be because there's no way that Andy Dalton can lead this team without Muhammad Sanu and Marvin Jones. Like, oh, my God, can he throw to A.J. Green and Tyler Eifert? Can he make Brandon LaFell and Tyler Boyd effective for us? There's no way he can, except for he's gotten three wide receivers big-time contracts, four if you count Andrew Hawkins getting a deal in Cleveland. And this is the other thing I made, you know, why is it that we have these talks and this talks with this team? They can't do this. They can't do that. The defense isn't mentioned once in this quote-unquote step back. Um, do I think they'll win 12 games again? Probably not. That's hard to do two years in a row. Uh, you don't see that happen too often. Um, do I think they're still one of the best teams in the AFC? Totally. Um, do I understand to a point that you feel these things? Sure. Uh, if you're, if you, you know, the Tyler Boyd's on proving he's a rookie? Okay. Um, but I make this point in that article, too. I break down the last two healthy seasons Brandon LaFell and Marvin Jones had. Ah, uh, gee, how many of those games did uh, Brandon LaFell outdo Marvin Jones? Just about all of them. And then they make the point of, he says, um, 
and Matthew, you know, I'm just going to bring you in here real quick. So he says you lose the guy you third downfield to quite a bit in Muhammad Sanu. When the hell was the last time Andy Dalton threw it downfield to Muhammad Sanu? I think once in the past uh, 32 games. Right. So, David Carr, my point is that you are sheer lazy with your analysis of Cincinnati Bengals. You didn't pick up any stats. You didn't put any effort in. You just said these two guys are gone. And there's no one to pull coverage away from A.J. Green. When the hell did Marvin Jones and Muhammad Sanu pull coverage away from A.J. Green? Tell me that. I- I'm waiting for that answer. It's just pure laziness, and that's what frustrates me about it. I understand that at NFL Network, you have 31 other teams you got to look and touch on. Um, but it's just – I know I keep re- I preview myself – it was the laziest reporting I've seen in a player in a team preview in a long time. And that includes all the guys I've seen from ESPN. That includes stuff Colin Coward and Skip Bayless has done in their laziness. You are more lazy than them, and that's why I'm frustrated. Well, let's 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 totally forget that Tyler Boyd in college had the second most all purpose yards behind, oh wait, Hall of Famer Tony Dorsett. Let's even forget the fact that he also missed Larry Fitzgerald's single season receiving record by one. Let's forget that Brandon LaFell has, oh wait, a Super Bowl ring, basically playing a wide wide receiver two position. Well, you know, and let's totally forget the fact that you're also looking at Cody Kaur, who has absolutely blown people away to possibly even get a wide receiver four position, to have two rookies on the offense basically almost starting. And that hasn't happened in how long. So let, let's totally forget about the fact that the Bengals know what they're doing. Oh, yeah, and let's also forget the fact that the quarterback coach who brought Andy Dalton to this point in his career is the offensive coordinator. So, since, again, as you said, since when is losing Hugh Jackson losing this entire offense? Since when is losing two, basically, number two and number three wide receivers become unreplaceable? Uh, not to mention when Giovanni Bernard was on the field, they were options four and five. I mean, it's... It, it, it's... I'll, I'll say it once and I'll say it again. And that is, David Carr, you never fail to let your critics down when you open your mouth and talk about football or play football. And that is, you can't do it. And why NFL Network has you there when they could turn around and get a Peyton Manning or they could get uh, any number of guys who have played the position oh, ten times better than you in the NFL. You did great in quarterback. You know what? Andy Dalton. You know what's that? Andy Dalton's played ten times better than David Carr did too. But, but, you know, you did okay. You did pretty good in college. You know, I heard ESPN College Game Day has an opening. Maybe you should go there. You'll probably be more useful. Because let's face it, you and Tim Tebow would do great together. Here's uh here's the like the last thing I saw that he did, and it just it uh, blows me away. So on NFL Now, he did the top 10 mobile quarterbacks in the NFL. And 1 through 9, I get it. I'm with them, you know. Cam being number 1, obviously. You can't argue that. No. Russell being 2. Pretty good, yeah. No, no, I'm sorry. He had Cam, Aaron Rodgers, Russell Wilson as 1 through 3. I love Aaron Rodgers. No, he's not He's not a better scrambler than Russell Wilson. Um, he, he, he's not even a better scrambler than Jameis Winston. <laughs> he had... You know, I think we can all agree by looking at career rushing touchdowns. Andy's a pretty damn good scrambler. He's a he's a good athlete. He makes things happen with his legs from time to time when he needs to. He's also um, caught a touchdown, hasn't he? Yeah, <laughs> he does. He does want to slide, and not take a hit. You know, he's he's always done those things. Blake Bortles was rated as a better scrambling quarterback than Andy Dalton. Um. I hate to say it, but um, Ben Roethlisberger is a better scrambler than Blake Bortles. Well, that's because he's just giant, and he's a mammoth, and the only thing that can take him down is 
No, no, not even the Georgia Police Department. <laughs> wow. I, you know, I, I, I don't even know how to respond to that one. <laughs> you could probably edit that out. That would, might, might be a good idea. No, no we'll, we'll, we'll keep that one in because that, that's pretty good. Yeah, thank I, you. I like thank that you. one. And he's, yeah. and you know, as a human being, he deserves that comment too. So, um, anybody I've met has, has said he's a complete and utter jerk in his personal life, not only on the field. So, um, you know, he's football smart. Obviously, uh, he's he's not very intelligent with the fact that the fans are the reason he's there. So, um, yeah, we'll keep that comment in. Don't worry about that one. Fair enough. So, yeah, that's just my point, man. Like, if he had been like, I'm concerned that the Bengals are going to struggle because, um, you know, I don't know if AJ Green's going to be able to handle the whole thing on his own with, with Tyler Eifert being out for a little bit. And, you know, you do lose Hugh Jackson. That kind of takes away your play calling scheme. Okay, you know, I can see your point there. I disagree, but I can see your point there. Um, it's the fact that he just, like, pulls all this stuff out of his ass. It doesn't make any sense. Um like, people act like Muhammad Sanu and Marvin Jones are world beaters, man. And, like, they're guys that benefited from A.J. Green. A.J. Green didn't benefit from Marvin Jones, Muhammad Sanu. There was never a time I remember in a press conference when a player go, when a coach went, well, the goal this week is to shut down Marvin Jones, Muhammad Sanu. Nope. No, I don't, I don't remember that ever. No. How many times have we heard, we got to make sure AJ Green doesn't get his hands on the ball, and we got to make sure in the red zone that we don't let Tyler Eifert cross the white line every week. We, we, we don't let... hear, we don't hear. Oh man, we got to make sure that Marvin Jones doesn't kill us. Well, and we we've even heard from coaches that the Bengals have one of the best receiving backs in the league, and we have to find a way to uh, shut down the screen and not let Giovanni and Bernard get past the line of scrimmage. We've even heard that. Yeah, we have. And I 100% agree with that statement. But good luck stopping him. Oh, exactly. I mean, the, he's a 5'8 little beast. Right. I think that's like the greatest Nick, the, the greatest way I've ever heard Giovanni Bernard analyzed. <laughs> well, I mean, it is true. It is, man. Um, he, it's awesome, though. Like, it's, it's, it's definitely a joy to watch him play every week. It is. No, I... I we we are very privileged as both fans and as writers to be able to cover somebody who actually is eh, no offense to Jeremy Hill because he has his own talents, but um, to to cover somebody who is as versatile of a back, and, and we're very lucky that he's now on for uh, you know three more years after this year, so we we get we get to look forward to uh, covering him for a long time. Absolutely. So, man, with that being said, I guess we can go ahead and start on these uh, two That's right, two previews we're going to do for um, the Bengals' opponents, starting with the New England Patriots. Um, obviously, the story being the Blake game, which was my rant in our last episode. So, we do know that we will be the second team Tom Brady sees. Um, I have been on record to say I think Tom Brady is going to wreak havoc and be pissed off at the world and take it out on the Browns and the Bengals those first two weeks. You have said that you think he's going to be a little... He's going to need some WD-40 before the Bengals game to kind of get in gear. Um, we've both talked about how much we like Deion Lewis as an NFL talent, and we were really happy to see him succeed last year before his injury. Uh, we both feel like he's going to end up being the number one running back because we don't think LeGarrette Blount can be consistent for 16 games. Um, we know, obviously, about the Gronk and how amazing the Gronk is. Uh, Scott Chandler, how good he's been since really taking that Aaron Hernandez role for this team. And really being that second tight end to really succeed uh, since Aaron Hernandez, you know, did that thing that we don't have to talk about. Um, they have a way of making slot receivers look like kings with Edelman and Danny Amendola. Um, Brandon LaFell, including, was one at one point one of those guys that made that happen there. Uh, defensively, they're solid. I, I think, you know, we've made this mention before uh, that I feel like the three best teams in the AFC are the Patriots, the Steelers, and the Bengals. And we've already gotten the Steelers out of the way at this point in the season. Uh, so it is Patriot time. Um, it's Gillette, man. Like, I think the closest the Bengals have come to winning at Gillette is like 17 points. Uh, the year T.O. and Chad were together, if 
if I remember in recent memory. Um, so it's it's not a happy place for the Bengals to go play. Um, so yeah, man, that that's that is the Patriots. I, I expect them to be the Patriots each and every year. I expect Belichick to have his evil mastermind to continue to have his team succeed, and uh, they're a team I expect to do big things yet again this year. No, I mean, I, the the big thing between. You know, with with the Bengals or with the Bengals, with the Patriots receivers, is they've got to stay healthy. Um, Gronk's got to right. stay healthy. Uh, so, you know, when you look at it that way, you know, it's really it's really difficult to sit there and say, oh well, you know, these guys are going to, uh, you know, they're going to win, they're going to do well. We, it's hard to say that obviously because. Um, going back, the last time the Bengals won in New England uh, would be back in 1986. Was the last time they won in New England? Um, they are 14 and nine versus. Well, let's see, 14 and nine. I've got to add uh, one in there. So they're they're 14 and ten versus uh, New England. Uh, what, one in five against Brady, I think. Something like that. Yeah. I was at the one win. Which was, of course, in Cincinnati. Um, yeah. And that was, the, that was the win that actually erased Brady's win streak, or not, or Brady's uh, touchdown, touchdown streak. streak. Yeah, because so, that was the game, like, they're driving in the fourth quarter, and this random storm comes in, and, like, runs are driving, and then leaves, and Pac-Man gets the interception. I think Mother Nature was a Bengal fan that day. She must have had money on him. <laughs> Yeah, somebody did. Uh, some higher power, for sure. But, um, no, I mean, the Bengals did uh, an incredible job uh, that game. And I think that, you know, again, we could see two very different uh, Tom Brady's. We could see one, as you said, somebody who is, you know, basically has a vendetta against the world and wants to tear everything apart. Um, but we very well could see... The, the Rusty haven't played a, a, a playoff caliber team um, since, well, the uh, AFC Championship. And yeah. so it, it comes down to we have two different Brady's we could see. And, and so it's just a matter of which one we will see. And then, you know, of course, I'm keeping the optimistic side. You're, you have a little bit of the pessimistic side. But um, the Bengals for sure are going to show up for that game. The, the bright side, I don't think it's a primetime game. Nope. So it's a one o'clocker. We don't have to worry about Andy Dalton in primetime. Uh, I shook that a little bit last year, but you know, still kind of came back with that Arizona game. Uh, he played great in the Arizona game. He, pl- he played very well in that Arizona. Oh, yeah, he played very well. It was Houston. Yeah. Houston was yeah. the game that that came back in. I'm sorry. Uh, it was the week before. It was when he was on that streak of... Uh, uh, of primetime games. Um, but, you know, it, it comes down to which which Patriots team are we going to see. Um, if Gronk's injured, obviously there's going to be a little bit of an issue. If um, Edelman gets injured, now you got to worry about, um, you know, where Gronk is a little more because he's going to rely a little heavier on Gronk. Um, so... You know, again, we're, there is scenarios going into this that obviously we don't know. And we don't know it every week. You know, we'll put that out there. But Tom Brady is the big question mark. So, um, I mean, there's a, there's a lot to prepare for. The Patriots' defense is good. Not great. Do you think they take a step back this year? I kind of think they do. I think they do, too. I, I think the Patriots' defense takes a, a step back. I think the Patriots as a whole take a step back because they're missing their starting quarterback for the first four weeks, and I don't think Jimmy, Jimmy Gropp can uh, can do the Tom Brady thing where he comes in for probably, arguably, at that point, one of the better quarterbacks in the league and becomes one of the better quarterbacks in the league instantly. Yeah, but I mean, I don't know, like, I see your point, and I don't think he'll by any way, shape, or form replicate Tom Brady, 
And their schedule's not very easy the first four weeks either, if, I'm, if I remember correctly. Because yeah, they start against the Cardinals in Arizona. Um, but I still think that if, if Jimmy Caroppolo can manage to go 2-2 two and two at the worst in those first four weeks, uh, they're, they're in pretty decent shape when Brady comes back. Well, which Brady are we... I said, it's just a matter of which Brady we get back. I mean, we've seen them go, what, 1-3? and three? And turn around just, and have an incredible season. I'm waiting for uh, I'm waiting for Roger Goodell to be like, uh, Tom Brady uh, put his right cleat on before his left cleat, and he was wearing different colored socks, so he's gonna be suspended two more games. <laughs> uh, he was he was uh, wearing Beats by Dre instead of uh, Bose, so uh, yeah, we 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 can't just have that. I'm sorry. And as we continue to look at these opponents, look at teams that we should really uh, that we are previewing week by week, another division foe, so we won't have to touch them twice. We can knock them out this week. The Cleveland Browns, the brand new look Cleveland Browns. Out goes Johnny Manziel, in comes Robert Griffin the third. Out goes sixty percent of the roster from last year, in comes a bunch of rookies. Um, Josh Gordon being back. That's cool news. So the Bengals will see him twice this year as long as he's healthy and on the field and doesn't get in trouble again. Um, makes him a little bit more dangerous there for sure. So the big story has got to be Robert Griffin to third and Hugh Jackson, which I know there's this big talk of a quarterback battle between Josh McCowan, rookie from USC, Cody Kessler, and Robert Griffin the third. Um, I think that's just all talk. Uh, I don't see any way that Robert Griffin the third is not starting for the Browns. Um, not saying that could change during this season, but I expect going into the year he's a starter. I really actually like Duke Johnson. If you remember when he did our fantasy football preview, I kind of said he was like my sleeper running back. Uh, I do think like Gary Bartage. I don't think that Barnkowski can do another year like he did last year even with maybe a more structured quarterback plan and having a wide receiver around him, like I said, like a Josh Gordon, uh, bringing Corey Coleman is a nice pickup for them. Uh, we all know how much I love CC going into the draft. Um, so this is a Browns team that I think will be better, but not good enough. Uh, but I still think that they are the fourth in the AFC North, just because I think Baltimore, Cincinnati, and Pittsburgh, when all healthy, are competitive football teams that – Will, you know, be in playoff the run for the playoffs every uh, every year, and I just don't think Cleveland's there yet. Though I don't, I think that Q can definitely make it happen. So, I don't know. I expect that they're probably a six-win team at best, and I think that they look into next year as far as getting a continuing to build from this team. But we gotta give some respect to Joe Thomas at least for one, being able to stick out his whole career there. Two. Missing one snap in his whole career, like, dude, props. Yeah. That that, it's a tough thing to do, especially in that atmosphere, uh, where you have a lot of expectations and uh, a lot, lot of little performances. Um, you know, they they had some promise a couple years ago. Then they brought in Johnny Manziel. <laughs> um. I mean, it, it wasn't sitting there going, oh, they're guaranteed to get in the playoffs. You know, they wouldn't have, but they had a lot better shot at that point. Um, you know, looking at Josh Gordon, I think, at least against the Bengals, is kind of going to be neutralized. Um, especially when you're looking at Adam Jones and Drake Kirkpatrick. Uh, even, you know, if you're, you're bringing in George Iloka, uh, Sean Williams over top. So I, I'm not so worried there. Um, Hayden's probably the biggest worry because Hayden has given Green a fit every year. Um, Since college. Yeah, and I, I mean the the plus side last year was he missed both games, uh, <laughs> but um, you know it's definitely going to be a place where we see really what Brandon LaFell and uh, Tyler Boyd and, and Cody Core and, and the guys there what they're made of. Um, the, these guys are, are going to have to step up and, and, you know, make adjustments because A.J. Green is going to be blanketed by Hayden for most of the game. 
Um, you know, it's not to say that AJ won't have a few catches and and won't you know perform decently, but uh, it's definitely a lot tougher with with Hayden on you. So, um, you know, they, they've got a couple good bright spots coming up. Uh, they're going to be tough down down the line, but uh, this year I think is still one that uh, you almost are able to kind of match up uh, both for wins. Yeah, um, I, like I said, um, what I do give them props for is doing something way different than anyone else, basically doing the money ball version of the NFL uh, with what they're bringing to their front office and everything. I think that's interesting, at least. Can we say that? And, um, you know, like I said, I, I, I like what Hugh Jackson is starting to build. Mm -hmm. I just think that they're far from established. So... And, and, you know, you make mention of Hayden, and that's definitely a case. Um, but AJ's given him some fits, too. Uh, we can't act like it's really been one-sided, though. It looks like it. Uh, AJ's had a, had a couple hundred-yard games on him. And those two definitely do go at it. It's a fun, fun battle every year. And uh, I think that it's going to take Joe Hayden a little bit to get back in line, too, uh, from all the time he's missed. So I think that that could definitely be in the favor of AJ Green. Uh, two being that, do the Browns have any safeties now that Dante Whitner's gone? I don't think they do. I don't think so either. Um, and, no, I don't think so either. And Justin Gilbert is still yet to show that he can play in the NFL. Yeah. Yeah. Remember the Browns were like, apparently like they like circled Dark West Denard, like they really wanted him. But the last minute they're like, we're going to go with him. Even worse, that that was the pick that was supposed to be Sammy Watkins, and they traded down to get Justin Gilbert. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Browns. Oh, Browns. Well, I will say this, and, and you know, and, and props to, to Jimmy Haslam for doing it, but he's a very intelligent businessman. Um, he he usually tries to make moves that uh, he feels are is going to benefit the business. Um, and, and so... We're looking at, at somebody who is is obviously dedicated to win uh, in some form or fashion, at least a game. Um, but you know the whole the whole Moneyball thing was yes was impressive, uh, but I, I think he did it to you know show that he may not he may know business more than he knows sports, but at the same time. You know, anything that he owns, anything that he is involved in, you know, he wants to be successful. Yeah, I, I do think he does for sure. Uh, I just think that, you know, and he had to make the change that he made. I just really hope that Hugh gets a chance, man. I just hope that they are patient with him to get everything he wants together. I hope he gets more than a couple of years to really make things happen, unlike every other uh Browns coach since the expansion. Um, Hal Belichick didn't even get a full opportunity when he was there. Isn't that crazy? Uh, but yeah, like it's just. Uh, I, I hope that Hugh really does get a chance to really do his thing and make something special happen there. He's got some decent talent. He's got some idiots. I mean, that's for sure. Um, Josh Gordon. Gordon, obviously, you know, not the, you know, one we keep talking about every year. And then uh, Isaiah Crowell being another one that just. What was it that stupid like thing he posted about like the cop getting their head slain or whatever? It's like Jesus Christ, man. Yeah. Um, did... Oh man, you know it just clicked with me. Okay. This is the first time we're gonna see Josh Gordon in those horribly those horrible new Cleveland Brown uniforms. <laughs> so, um, is that going to be the first time we can really mean who let the dogs out? <laughs> yes. Uh, we, can, we can answer the age-old question. Uh, well, the answer we the answer we know is uh, is Roger Goodell, since he did he is the one that reinstated him. But uh, you know, again, and the one big thing that we're looking at, even with with Gordon, is is he's not gonna he he may not be fully back either. Because we're looking at somebody who, by the way, is suspended for the first four games, too. Is he camp eligible? Can he participate? Uh, I believe so. I think he's been fully reinstated 
with a uh, with the uh, four game suspension just looming. Does he have like the Odell Thurman rule where like? I mean, he's got to be like. You remember the Odell rule where it's like you're reinstated, but you have to do these things. Uh, I don't. I don't know if there's too many m more com uh, conditions there. There might be because of that failed drug test before his reinstatement meeting. Um, and it wouldn't shock me. But um, at first, I, was, when you said Thurman, I, I had to get out of my head Uma Thurman. Uh, <laughs> well, Kill Bill's a fantastic film, so I understand. Well, and not to mention you went to, to Warp Tour. I mean, the Fall Out Boy song. Yeah, they didn't play this year. I know they didn't. They were on their own tour with, I think, Weezer. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's Zayn Panic at the Disco. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Needless to say, um, he and he might he might have something looming over top of him because of that failed uh, failed drug test before the the reinstatement meeting the first time around. Uh, so it wouldn't shock me if he has to still complete a, a rehab program and stay clean and pass so many drug tests. Now that we're on the topic, before we get out of here, um, is Odell Thurman the biggest waste in talent in Bengals history? Um, only one I put probably above him is Kajana, Kajana Carter. Um, but that's like, he broke his leg. Like, th but that one was due to injury, but there again, he had so much potential. So much potential, and uh, that's saying a lot because I'm an Ohio State fan, and he was a uh, Penn State boy. But um... <laughs> Chris Perry's on the on the list too because he just oh my god, I'll forever be mad about that draft. Perry, yeah, uh, I, I'm trying to think who else because uh, there was one other one that I'm trying to I'm trying to remember that was supposed to was supposed to be like the next big thing. And, uh, I'm... Big Daddy Wilkinson's probably on that list, because he did not work out here for some reason. Well, Big Daddy Wilkinson did well a couple of years, so I I'm hesitant on him. Um, he had a great... He had a great couple of years. There was, there was some left on the field, but, you know, he at least had a couple contributing years. So, he, he moves up that list a little bit. Um, and... and trying to remember because I don't think it was a number one pick but I, I don't know I'm, I'm blanking on uh, on some of their 90s picks because I mean like we gotta look man like Odell like that his the one year he played like he was special like he was awesome yeah uh, you know and it's like man we got this guy for like this whole career this is gonna be great was he had 115 tackles? Oh, and I remember his stat line. Give me a minute here. I think he had 115 tackles. I think three sacks and five interceptions his rookie year, and did not get a defensive rookie of the year. Okay, I yeah, and I forgot about this one, Achilles Smith. Ah, uh, yeah. I just think he just didn't have it, and he just fooled some people at his at the combine. Yeah, that that's who I was trying to remember. I was I I knew there was one other one, but no, I mean. In that case, can we put Klinger on the list too? Can we put Klinger on the list? Yeah, yeah. he's probably got to be on there. He he's somewhere on there. He's definitely somewhere on there. Um, because he only what? I'm trying to remember how long he even played. He was the he was the replacement of Boomer Asias when Boomer Asias with the Jets. That's okay. Oh well. Yeah. And I, I'm 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 kind of concerned you just LOL'd me. Uh <laughs> Especially especially on a uh, podcast that we're recording. Uh That's okay. <laughs> um, Renard Wilson might be there too. Ah, I forgot about him. Uh but he had 24 sacks in that time. So he did he did all right. He would be another one that probably fall underneath the uh, the rule of Dan Wilkinson. But see, as I said, Dan Wilkinson had what 54, 54 and a half sacks. 
Yeah, but none of those guys made the splash that Odell Thurman did. Like, Odell Thurman looked like he was going to be the Bengals' middle linebacker till probably about now. No, no, no. I, I'm, I'm just saying that's why, that's why they're on the list, but they're not, they're not near Odell. Uh, however, Achilles Smith is. Um, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> there's a competition there. Um, no, and, and and probably the best, the, and I say this in, in all honesty, the best pick they made in the '90s was Willie Anderson. Um, by far in 90, 96. Um, Willie and Corey definitely were like the two best picks they made. Well, Cor, Cor, Corey Dillon? Yeah. That was a second round pick. Well, I'm saying, yeah, I'm saying in general, like, if you're, you didn't, re, you didn't say first round only. True. In that case, yeah, you're right. True. Well, to that, to that point too then, would, um... Slim Pickens would have to be on there then, right? Because Slim Pickens was pretty damn good in the nineties. He was all right for sure. Uh, you can't can't complain what he did. Um, you can because he ended up being a jerk and like you know doing the whole like I'll retire before I play another season with the Bengals thing. But I get it. Yeah. Well, and that uh, there was definitely some animosity there. Um, oh, for sure. I was trying to think. There's, there's one more in there that I can't. I'm, I'm blanking on. Um, can, yeah, there's definitely way more bad picks in the '90s than good when we talk about the Cincinnati Bengals. Yeah, well, that one is, is kind of a no duh on all of our sides there. But I was trying to think. There was one more that I was trying to think of that had a pretty solid career that the Bengals picked up, and I'm just not remembering and let's some... see um spikes wasn't terrible no spikes was actually really good like brian simmons was really good he just never made the pro bowl because there was like someone that had bigger name than him every year our trail wasn't terrible a nice guy too no, he, he wasn't he, he played you know he played well just I mean, was, he was he wasn't a big splash player. He just he was no. an effective player. Yeah, um, he was effective. That's a good point. If we're getting into like two thousand, Peter Warwick was a decent. Could have done more, but he was a decent pick. Knee injuries. That yeah. Again, we're going back to the whole uh, injury type thing. Like Dude, we're I'll tell you in. now, Peter Warwick's my one of my favorite Bengals ever. Like I still have a signed helmet. In this time where I'm selling all my memorabilia, I have kept my signed Peter Warwick helmet. Yeah, especially since you're not getting top dollar for some helmets. <laughs> no, not at all. But, I mean, I'm sure a Florida State fan would pay a lot for it. Yeah, probably. But, that's, uh. but yeah, like, um, I was a huge work guy. But, like, you know, let's say pre-Lewis era, yeah, like, it was hard to find guys that stood out in drafts. Yeah. Because I think the last draft before Marvin was Chad and Rudy. Chad, Rudy, and TJ. So that was like the last draft where the Bengals got it right. Yeah, because in 2000, 2002 was his first draft, wasn't it? That was Yeah, 03 was the year that... Yeah, 03, because that was the year they drafted Carson. Yeah. And that draft was actually pretty good. Yeah. Um, Eric Steinbach ended up having a pretty good career. Um... That was the year Kelly Washington, but he battled injuries. Dennis Weathersby could just never recover from when he, like, unfortunately got shot. But he was like a freaking, he was like a first round pick that they got in the fourth, if you remember. Yeah. Um, the yeah. 05 draft is the ultimate what if draft, though. Um, you got Pollock in the first. Yeah. You got Odell in the second. Yeah. Chris Henry. Yeah. Um, Tab Perry was in that draft. Or do you remember, like, the one year that he was, like, healthy and played? He was a hell of a kick returner. Yeah, that is true. Yeah, man, like that that was a that was a that was a draft, man. Like that was when you saw like Marvin putting this like magic together, you're like, damn, like even those couple years that Marvin had where they struggled, like, they still drafted well. Well, I mean in in Except for taking Chris Perry and trading down when they could have had Steven Jackson. Yeah. Oh, it makes me so mad. Now, 2006 was one that had a couple of good ones in the 
The question that's, I have is... Uh, J. Joe, right? That's Jonathan Joseph's draft, right? Yep, that's Jonathan jo Frosty Rucker. Oh, yeah. Who's actually been a pretty decent player for the Cardinals now. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Glenn Holt <laughs> was the undrafted free agent that made the team. Yep. And, uh... But, yeah, I, I think up until... Up until that draft, because, of course, Andrew Whitworth... Who actually? I find it funny they still list. Oh, they list him in the draft or on on pro reference or football reference. They list Andrew Whitworth on the draft as a tackle. He actually was a guard. Yeah. Um, in that draft, uh, so he wasn't a tackle. He became a tackle. Um, but really, even before that, the only good draft that they was stand out, excellent draft, um, would have been the. Uh, the Ocho and Rudy and and Hush of uh, who, uh, 01. Who was the first? Who was their first round pick that year? I can't remember for the life of me. First round pick of that year was yeah. Justin Smith. That's right. Oh my God. Yeah, I totally forgot about that. Which that was a hell of a draft. Which he he's retired now. I think his last year was fourteen. Yeah. He, yeah. He retired. Uh. The year after he played, the year after the Niners went to the Super Bowl. Um, but he only played for he only played for the Bengals for for four years, didn't he? Yeah, because um, if you remember, it came down to those like, do they want to sign Justin Smith long term, or do they want to sign Eric Steinbeck long term? And they did not make the right decision there. <laughs> no, they didn't. But then again, if you look at it, we have uh, Michael Johnson. We have... Uh, well, at that time, they did not, though. No, but I'm saying it actually ended up working out pretty pretty good in the end. I mean, um, because if, if you have that kind of guy, are you really then looking to draft? Your your Michael John or uh, pick up your Michael Johnsons and uh, True. your Carlos Dunlaps because Dunlap didn't come in. Dunlap came in two thousand ten. The Bengals got him in the second round, if you remember, because he got in trouble in college. Yeah, and that was like the best thing that happened to the Bengals in like the worst way. Well, and then you have uh, probably I don't know. You you've got another one that that. In recent times, that dropped to the Bengals that probably shouldn't have dropped to the Bengals because of uh, some issues, uh, especially character issues. Vontez? No. Well, Vontez, yeah. I mean, he went undrafted, <laughs> but Cedric Ogbui dropped to the Bengals. He was supposed to be, if it wasn't for the injury and some slight run ins at Texas AM, he was supposed to be a top 10. Right. And he dropped all the way down to 21 for the Bengals. So, uh, Bengals have had a little bit of luck as of uh, as of recently with that. In the Marvin Lewis era, you can probably think of like six guys, maybe. Now, that might be exaggerating. That were like, eh, that's not a good pick. You know, like if you think like, maybe like Chase Kaufman didn't work out here. No. Um, I don't, I, and then, you know, obviously, you know, like I've mentioned Chris Perry. Gresh. Um, what's that? Gresham. Gresham. But I give him a little benefit because he did have some good years. He just was never what we thought he was, like, what they thought he was going to be. Jordan Shipley. Injuries. Yeah. Also old. Jordan Shipley was 2010. Jordan Shipley was 28 years old when he was a rookie. Was he that old? Yeah. I don't, for some reason, I don't remember him being that old, but I, I believe you on that one. Yeah, because that was, uh, yeah, they went, which even on paper, like at the time, that draft looks pretty good, of Gresham, Dunlap, Shipley, you're like, that's pretty solid. It just didn't pan out. Reggie McNeil ended up not panning out in his time, because he, he couldn't make the transition from quarterback to wide receiver. Keith Rivers. Right. Yeah, he's he's the one where, like, I, I circle, actually. Um... I get there's the jawbreaking incident, but after that, he just, man, like, I don't ever remember a game where I go, remember when Keith Rivers made the play that saved the game? No, he only played six years in the NFL. Yeah. Oh, eight to 14, if I'm not mistaken. Such a shame. He could have been so good. 
And then the other one, which, whatever happened to Kenny Irons? Uh, first preseason game he ever plays, pops his knee, ends his career. In, on four, at Ford Field. That's right. I forgot that, because he, he not only did, he did nerve damage, didn't he? Yeah, dude, like, so what Jalen Smith is going through, multiply that by three. Yeah. That's what happened to Kenny Irons. That's right. Okay. Because cause I know he was second round in 07 and just kind of disappeared completely. And I, I never, never heard what actually, I never remembered what actually happened to him. But now I am. Okay. Uh, right. But um, do, you, do we even have any picking up or putting down this week? I think we ran a little long with this discussion here, so. All right, well. We'll, Here's we'll, my idea for next week's show. All right. So we'll be doing we'll, we'll be doing the Redskins and Eagles, which we've already talked about these teams already. Um, so that'll be easy. Next week, I don't know if you listen to Paul Darren or Paul Darren or Junior's podcast at all for the Enquirer. Uh, every once in a while, I pick it up. They did a they did one this week, uh, these past few weeks, doing their Cincinnati Bengals first class Ring of Honor. Because they were saying if you know if the Bengals had a Ring of Honor, who would you put in there? And they chose four guys. I say next week we do that. So I'm giving you a week to think about it. Okay. Come up with five names that you put in the put in the Ring of Honor. Doesn't matter if you have to put two quarterbacks, if you want to put you know whatever. Uh, the five names they have to be retired players now. Yeah. Well, and I kind co- of coaches don't count because obviously Paul Brown would be in there. Well, yeah, and so would uh, probably Ken White. Steve. Yeah. Sam White. Or Sam White. Sorry, Sam White. I I don't know why. I just I, I think I was thinking a quarterback who I might put in put in there and uh, just ma- just match them together. It's all good. So yeah, I think that that could be fun. So we're thinking and, five, five play. Yeah, and let's okay. let's do this. Let's do a um. Let's do a Twitter poll to get some of the fans in on it too. Okay. We'll do. We'll, I'm down. We'll, we'll we'll put up a, we'll put up a couple polls um to see if we can it, it'll almost kind of like be a bracket type thing uh, we'll have to do kind of that um but um and, and le- let's make let's make one more rule to All the right. the ring of honor because they would absolutely uh, he would absolutely already be in it and he's a guaranteed Anthony Munoz does not count to be in your ring of honor because obviously he's the guaranteed right okay. So, I, so, can, I can live with that. So, Anthony Munoz is already in five more players. That would be six total uh, with Anthony Munoz already guaranteed. So, um, I'm almost half tempted to knock out one more, but, but I'll, I'll leave him in. Yeah, because then we can go on for hours. So, uh, we'll, 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 we'll leave in one certain player, and I'll, I'll reveal who that is because he'll be in my ring of honor anyway. So, Yeah, for sure. Awesome. So with that being said, we'll go ahead and close out this week's edition of Men in Stripes, brought to you by StripePipe.com, a fan site exclusive network. Many thanks again to Mo Egger for joining us and giving us a Twitter follow. And you should, too, if you don't already, at Men in Stripes SH on Twitter. Any suggestions, anything you want to talk about on the show and you want us to discuss, feel free to send us an email at meninstripessh at gmail.com. Matthew, a privilege through all the battles of technology this week, we finally overcome. Absolutely, it's it's always it's always a privilege and and uh, an absolute honor, and uh, we'll uh, we'll reveal some stuff uh, as, in in a few weeks because I know you're getting some some new stuff up and running too. I am, man. So, uh, yeah, for sure. So we'll 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 reveal that as well and, and give you a couple shout outs on that stuff. Uh, but uh, other than that, you know, obviously read all all the stuff on on stripepipe.com and. Uh, We'll, we'll continue to follow training camp and, and some of the battles and stories that, that happen there. Absolutely. And thanks again, everybody, and a big who dare.